that this was been done. Nothing but by your name that this miracle has been wrought. That you will receive all glory and honor and we will truly have a thanksgiving. We'll be able to praise your name and give you all glory and honor. We won't take any credit to ourselves. So I pray to God Jesus this morning as we keep you in focus that we'll listen to our master servant brother Bill crown him from the blessing from the crown of his head to the sole of his feet. And I pray to God Jesus for all of the unspoken prayer requests that you will keep us and save us from the lions and the giants in our lives that we face every day and from the dens of iniquities that we have to run away from every moment. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Happy Sabbath, everyone. Our scripture reading this morning is taken from the Old Testament. Our scripture reading this morning is taken from Numbers, chapter 21. And I will read in your hearing verses 1 through 5. Numbers, chapter 21. And I will read in your hearing verses 1 through 5. Once you have it, please say amen. And when King Arad, the Canaanite, which dwelt in the south, heard tell that Israel came by the way of spies, then he fought against Israel and took some of them prisoners. And Israel vowed a vow unto the Lord and said, If thou wilt indeed deliver this people into my hand, then I will utterly destroy their cities." And the Lord hearkened to the voice of Israel and delivered up the Canaanites. And they utterly destroyed them and their cities. And he called the name of the place Horma. And they journeyed from Mount Hor by the way of the Red Sea to compass the land of Edom. And the soul of the people was much discouraged because of the way. Verse 5, And the people spake against God and against Moses. Wherefore have ye brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness, for there is no bread, neither is there any water, and our soul loatheth, loath excuse me, this light bread. The next voice you'll hear after special music by Sister Helen will be that of Elder Moody. Good morning, happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. <laughs> In this month of Thanksgiving, it seems time to thank God for our blessings. This song is called For All the Blessings of the Year. Oh. 
Praise the Lord. I want to thank Sister Helen for that song. Um, she didn't know the title of the sermon. She didn't know the sermon or what it was about. Uh, but as I was listening to the song, I realized the Holy Spirit understood. And so I, I appreciated it. Um, I was talking with the young people downstairs about being thankful, being grateful. And... Out of that conversation, young Joshua volunteered to sit closer to the front of the church. <laughs> he volunteered. I said he volunteered. I tell you. <laughs> so I'm so thankful that we have young people here who are eager to, to understand more. Amen. And the people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water, and our soul loathes this worthless bread. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for today. We thank you because you've walked with us, Lord. You've carried us through difficult times in our lives. And we know nothing better than to thank you and to praise you. And bless your name. Father, we're thankful for the health that you've given us. Yes, we may have aches and bruises, and we, we may not move the way we wish we could, but we thank you that we have movement. We thank you that we have breath and life. And dear God, we ask now that you will, you will take your stand, that you will sit here and, and teach us that we can understand you better, that we can live a life of praise and a life that looks towards you and, and thanks you and blesses you for all the things that you've done in our lives. Be with us this day. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. You know, the first chapter of Numbers, it starts out, the children of Israel are two years into the wilderness. And in the first chapter, it says, God basically talks to Moses and says, Moses, I want you to number the children of Israel, everyone from 20 and up, 20 years old and up. And so Moses goes on and he starts to, you know, number the children of Israel. Now, if you've ever, some of you aren't, aren't like me, but there are times where my, my Bible laziness steps in. And I look at a chapter and I see names and names and, you know, if I'm with a group, sometimes I'm hoping somebody will say, well, just skip down a few verses, you know. But groups, they never let you off, right? They make you go through every name in the Bible. And so, I, you know, when you start off in the book of Numbers, it's like, oh, my goodness. Is this what it's about? That seems no fun. Then I, I was looking at the uh, Seventh-day Adventists. They have a Bible commentary that they put out. And I was looking at this uh, history or whatever of the book of Numbers. And it was interesting to note that the, the name numbers is derived from a Hebrew word which doesn't mean numbering. That I thought was cool. <laughs> the book of numbers comes from a Hebrew word which is uh, bamidbar or something similar to that. And it actually means translated in the desert or in the wilderness. 
Now that sounds like a book, if you told me to go read about the book called In the Wilderness, that seems like a book that I could sit down and and cozy up to. I mean, that seems like a book that's going to have a whole lot of other other things. And so now I'm not thinking, oh, it's just going to be about these names and numbers and, and tribes and names and numbers that I can't pronounce. That in fact, it's going to be about God in the desert. In fact, it's going to be about God's teachings in the desert. God's people in the desert. God's leading in the desert. Deserts are inevitable. They are inevitable. For the children of Israel, this was definitely so. There was no way for the children of Israel to go from sinful Egypt to the promised land without going through a desert. It was impossible. couldn't happen. And in fact, in the, in the Christian life, you'll, if you live long enough, you'll find that there's, it's impossible to reach our promised land without going through a desert. And some of you, if, you, if you've lived long enough, you can look back on certain times of your life and point out those deserts. Say, yeah, yeah, I, I remember that time. Because it's in the desert that, that character gets formed and, and character gets shaped and molded. And it's in the desert that God starts to work with us. I remember Paul said, you know, when God hit him, Knocked him off his horse, you know. When God came to him on the road to Damascus, Paul says, I went to the deserts of Arabia for three years. There's always going to be these deserts. So so here here we have the, the children of Israel, and they're in the desert. And while they were in the desert, it's nice to know, and this is true for your life too, it's nice to know that while you're in your desert, God is focused on you. I mean, it, it'd be t- deserts would be tough if God didn't focus on you. You know, it, deserts would be impossible if God didn't look back and say, okay, I'm going to walk you through this. I'm going to carry you through this. And, and, and so as we read the book of Numbers, we find out that God, in fact, was, was keenly and uniquely focused on the children of Israel. But unfortunately, Israel wasn't equally focused on God. And I wish I could say that about myself. You know, sometimes when God is really focused on me in my desert, I'm focused on everything else. Oh, I'm focused on this relationship, this job, this money, this or lack thereof. Everything else. Israel was focused on everything else. And you can tell they were fo- what their focus was based on The way they complained. Oh, Israel had a lot of complaints. Israel had. (laughs) You know, I think God, God is so big and so strong. uh, He's willing to tolerate a certain amount of complaining. You talk about complaining, it's a bad thing. But but generally speaking, I think that God actually has a... place and I look at my own life and I I had one the worst conversation I had with God I was on 787 and I was just telling God off it was right as 787 pulls into Clinton Avenue and I was just letting God have it and when I look back at that time I think man it's good thing God didn't just wipe me off you know it's good thing I mean because had I got side hit by a truck or whatever I mean I was letting them have it And, and I noticed that God God, in in history, he's always allowed people that one-on-one venting. I don't quite think he's as bothered by it. I think the the, the distinction, though, is with God, the the complaining that God is most worried about is the kind that's spread. It's when my complaining goes from me to Marty to Joseph to Kai. It's when I start to make that a, a groundswell. And you'll notice that when in the Bible, when, when the children of Israel, you know, one would have a complaint, that's one thing. But when they started to sort of communally start to complain and, and argue and, and have all kinds of issues and gripe with God, that's when God said enough. That's when God cut things off. Moses complained. Elijah complained. Job complained. I, I, I was reading, I think it was, uh, I, I think it was Habakkuk. Don't quote me on this, but I think it was Habakkuk. Habakkuk had some, I'm paraphrasing, said something like, 
God, are you blind? It was, it was that like, matter, like, God, do you see this? I mean, Habakkuk was complaining. In the book of Numbers, I, I want to almost start off, we won't read this part, but in, in Numbers chapter 11, the children of Israel are complaining just because. I mean, Numbers 11 starts out with the children of Israel complaining, and I kid you not, it is just because. Have you ever been around people like that? <laughs> they complain just because. I, I, I actually, when I read it, I went back and said, well, well what happened in, in, in chapter 10 that would cause this complaining, and I couldn't find anything. And I said, wow, it was just because, you know, it was Tuesday, and that was therefore they had to complain. And so the children of Israel complained just because. And God responded. And then later on in Numbers chapter 11, we, we, uh, Marina talked about this last week. The children of Israel complained that they, they didn't have enough flesh to eat. You know, they were in the desert and, and they said, we don't have enough flesh to eat. And you remember what God did? Did God respond to that? What, what, what did she say? God, God said, I'll send you some quail. And they had a lot of quail. <laughs> <laughs> you know, quail is like a chicken, you know. And so they were they were cooking up quail like they you like I guess you could cook it like you cook a chicken. You know, they 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 had jerk quail. They probably had tandoori quail. <laughs> some clay oven quail. I mean, they were out in the desert, right? So they probably had some some of y'all vegetarians, you know. They, 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 <laughs> They had some nice quail, man. Don't, don't, get it, don't get it twisted. They had some quail, all kinds of oven-baked quail. And, the, and the, they had so much quail was coming out of their noses. Is that a lot of food? Have you ever, have, has anyone here ever overeaten? Come on now. All right. Okay, just raise your hand in your, in your mind. Don't even, raise your eyebrow. Just, Right, we don't want to. Don't want to. You were Adventists. We don't overeat, right? <laughs> Come on, now. Marina, get on them. Okay. Now, 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 have you ever overeaten to the point that it came out your nose? Everybody's like, no. And if you did, would you remember it? Yeah, yeah. Michael says, of course I'd remember it. They ate so much quail it came out of their noses. God had, he had to respond. They said they wanted flesh. He had to respond. So in Numbers chapter 14, you know, the complaining didn't stop there. Turn here, though. In Numbers chapter 14, this we should read together. In Numbers chapter 14, are you there? No. Numbers 14, verse 2. And the children of Israel murmured against Moses and against Aaron. And the whole congregation said unto them, Would God that we had died in the land of Egypt. Wow. Or would God we had died in the wilderness. Now, you know, I'm, I'm like a, I used to watch Superman and when I was a kid. And this thing Superman would do, he'd fly around the earth to reverse time, right? He had to bring Lois Lane back. You remember the story. <laughs> so we, okay, you guys don't watch TV either. Anyway, Superman had this superpower where he would fly around the earth and reverse time. Well, God wasn't about to reverse time and send them back to Egypt. But because their complaint was, what God that we had just died in the wilderness? And God heard that. And guess how God responded? They died in the wilderness. And, and, and God called them on. God said, oh, you want to die in the wilderness? Okay. And Moses, Moses just, just a humble, meek man, right? Moses tried to talk God out of it. He said, God, you don't want to do this, man. Yeah, everybody's looking at you, God. You don't want to, the, the other nations, God, they're going to say all these things. And God said, I'm not worried about that. The people who complained, that, matter of fact, verse 19, Numbers 14, verse Verse 19, pardon, I beseech thee, the iniquity of this people, according to the greatness of thy mercy. And as thou hast forgiven this people from Egypt, even, even until now. And the Lord said, I have pardoned according to thy word. I pardoned. But as truly as I live, when God says that, as truly as I live, all the earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord. 
because all those men which have seen my glory and my miracles which I did in Egypt and in the wilderness and have tempted me now these ten times and have not hearkened to my voice, surely they shall not see the land which I swear unto their fathers. Neither shall they see any of them that neither shall any of them that provoked me see it. And then he makes an exception for Caleb. So, so they are out there complaining that we wish we would have died. And God said, good enough. Good enough. You skip down to Numbers chapter 20. And they complained about not having anything to drink. Now, I, you're human. I've been thirsty. You've been thirsty, right? They had nothing to drink. They're in the desert and they're complaining. They had nothing to drink. So God did something really cool. He said, hey, Moses... Go up to this rock, talk to the rock. I'm going to do something really crazy. I'm going to give them water from a rock. <laughs> now, that's, that's kind of like far out, right? I was in Fort Lauderdale. Had to be eight years ago, something like that. Now, if you don't know, Fort Lauderdale gets hot. I mean, they, they get super hot. And I was, the way, the way their streets are, sep are, are work, in, in many of the streets, you have these like islands down in the middle of the street, right down in the center. And on certain streets like 441 and some of these other ones, that's where they sell the newspaper. So you'll see the Sun Centennial guys out there selling the newspaper, trying to get you to buy the newspaper. Well, this one particular day, I'm in the car, and even with the AC, I was burning up. It was just super hot. And I was like, man, I'm, I'm hot. I'm thirsty. And so all of a sudden, I see these young people come up to the car, and they're not carrying newspapers, but they're giving me these, bottle, these bottles of water. So I roll down the window. A guy puts it right into my hands. And you, could, you, you knew it was, it was nice because it was, it was so cold that the condensation was on the bottle. I mean, it, it felt cold. And you could tell it was cold before you even grabbed it. And I was like, oh, thank you. You know, I grabbed it out of the man's hand. I start to go grab my wallet, and the guy said, no, 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 brother. You know, it, it's free from, it's, it's from the Lord, as, as free as mercy is or, or grace. He gave some nice, nice biblical quote. And then I said, well, look, let, you know, it was a church that was doing this. They were handing out water. And they took regular bottles that had not been opened, and they took a piece of paper and printed some note from their church and wrapped it around the bottle. And so that's what they handed out on a hot day in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. And they wouldn't even take a donation. I mean, it's a church. I said, look, just take a donation. because this is a, You just really did me a solid, right? So I'm just trying to, they said, no, 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 brother. It's, it's absolutely free. Now, let me tell you what. I will never forget that. I will never forget that. And had I lived in Fort Lauderdale, I might have been inclined to at least visit the church once. Wouldn't that, now, that's an idea for someone here, right? That's a, <laughs> think about this. this is a, the summer will be back. Trust me, it will be. If I won't ever forget that, imagine seeing water come from a rock. And imagine being in a desert. And, and, and here you see this, this leader. He hits the rock, but the point is the water came out of a rock. That just sounds awesome. That just sounds like one of those things that you put in the way and you say, I will never forget this a day in my life. I mean, have you, have you ever had those things in your life that you say, I'll, I'll, this will never, ever make it out of my memory? So then we get to Numbers chapter 21. And Pedro, read the, Pedro read the scripture verse. Numbers chapter 21. Verse, verse 5 puts it this way. And the people spake against God and against Moses. Wherefore have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? Like, like really, that's what God apparently, would, that was the plan, apparently. For there is no bread. And some, in some of the other versions, your versions, it may say there is no food. Neither is there any water, and our soul loatheth this light bread. Now, to make the claim that there is no food, for someone who was fed by quails when quails were coming out of their mouth and their noses, 
the audacity to make the claim that there is no food. When you serve a God who can give you enough quail to come out of your nose. It's unbelievable. To then come out of your same mouth and say, there is no water. When you serve a God who took water and brought water out of a rock. And that wasn't the only time. In fact, in, in, in uh, Exodus chapter 25, they were in this place called Elam. And the Bible says that there were 12 springs of water and 70 palm trees. And they camped near the water. I mean, if you camped near 12, 12 springs in a desert, you'd remember that. But there's something about the, the, the mind that at times when you want to complain, complain right? It, you, just, you just, facts don't even matter. Right? I mean, I, there are times where I've done it myself where I, I complain about something and then somebody just brings a fact like, no, 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 remember X, Y, Z? And you're like, oh, be quiet. You know? <laughs> I'm, I'm feeling good right now. I'm, I'm, you know, don't, don't spoil my complaining role. Facts didn't matter to them. And then they go on further and they say, we, we have this bread. Remember, they, they were getting bread. If you, we didn't read it, but if you didn't know or if you don't know the story of the children of Israel, as they were going from Egypt to the promised land, God decided, you don't have food? Okay, I'm going to give you bread from heaven every day. God said, I'm going to give you bread from heaven every day. So every day they got bread from heaven. And then you find out years later that now they're saying, we loathe. We loathe this bread. And they didn't even say bread. They said this, this worthless bread. This, this, this despicable bread. I looked at Strong's Court Concordance and I found it quite amazing that the word that they used to describe the bread is used nowhere else in the Bible. Some of you don't understand what this is like. I, I have been told off by so many people that I can't count. And I have had people say things to me that I'll just never repeat. And, and at times I've had someone tell me off so royally that they actually used a word. It's almost like they went into their bag of SAT words and, and came out and said, you are this? It's like they thought about it, like they, they spent some time and went through a dictionary and at the source just to come up with a word to describe me. They couldn't just say you're an idiot or you're a fool. Or you're, they couldn't just come with something basic. I mean, they, they really reached back and, well, I'm going to make you really feel how badly I feel about you. And when Israel said, we load this worthless bread, they were reaching back to describe that bread. They were coming up with a word that they don't even use in the Bible. I mean, that, that, that's a, it, it goes beyond regular complaining. It, it's, it's, it's as if, if you know, if, 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 one day, if one day Rachel says, you know, and she may, she may have already uh, said, you know, I really can't stand the way Bill rakes the leaves. That's fine. But when you complain about the leaf raker God gave you, <laughs> that, that's another story, right? You know, complain about how I, maybe how I do something, but man, when the complaint starts to reach, like, okay, wait a minute, you, you know, you've been in those conversations where the complaining about the spouse is a little more than acceptable, right? The way they complained about what was going on, Israel had reached that level where it, it, lo it lost respect. They were no longer just complaining about circumstances. In fact, they were directing their complaints to God and saying, God, we hate you. We wish we had another God. We, we really, I mean, we're, we're talking about this bread, but man, we're really talking about you, God. We're really talking about you. It's interesting. When the book of Numbers 21 took place. As I mentioned, uh, it's kind of a, a history these children were in, in Egypt. Uh, they weren't living high on the hog, contrary to popular belief. They were slaves. 
And God decided to bring them out of this place of slavery and bring them into a promised land, a land of their own. And this is, there's, uh, Moses is, is commanded by God to send some spies and to spy out the land. So Moses takes these 12 spies and, and he sends them out and they spy out this land of Canaan which was obviously good and an obviously a fruitful land. And so when they all came back, only two of them gave a positive report about the land, but the other ten gave a very negative and, and fearful report of the land. So the whole congregation listened, and they had an opportunity to either pay attention or, or give deference to the two or to go with the ten. And they chose to go with the ten. They chose to believe this, this bad and fearful report. And so it was because of that, that the journey from Egypt to, the, to Canaan, rather than taking what is estimated to be two years, was now 40 years. So a, a, a journey that should have only been two, went another 38. And it's, it's interesting because God could have simply said, as a result of your unfaithfulness, as a result of your disbelief in who I am, you're going to spend another 38 years in the desert and don't call me. I mean, that's how we would punish, right? You're going to, yeah, don't call me, lose my number, right? God could have said, lose my number. For 40 years, let me know how, what you think after that. But rather than God just abandoning them for 38 more years, instead God said, let me tell you what I'll do. Those shoes that you have on your feet, those very same shoes will not wear out. You see this, this, this pillar in the sky, that's that very same pillar that, that was shade and covering you in the day, That'll stay. This, this fire that, that's there at night keeps you warm and keeps other things away. That, that same fire that lets you know I'm there. That same fire that makes other people look down on you and say, God is there in that camp. That same fire, I'll keep it there for another 38 years. Those, those, all, the, all the reptiles and the animals and wild animals and beasts of the field, all those things that would normally rip you apart for another 38 years, I'll, I'll keep you protected. The diseases and all the sicknesses and all these other things that would normally ail you for another 38 years, I'll sustain you from that. Food, I got food for you. Water, I got water for you. That sounds like mercy. That sounds like God was actually going above and beyond the call of duty. That sounds like for, for another 38 years, Israel really should have been on their own. But God said, I'll, I'll be there. I'll focus on you. And this Numbers chapter 21 is at the point where they are sort of at the cusp. I mean, they're, they're kind of winding down this 40-year time. And so they're right, on, you know, they're right on the edge of entering into the promised land. And then they say this, you know, right on the edge of the promised land. And then they pull this kind of amazing, there's no food, no, no water. And you know what, God, we hate this bread. This worthless bread. So God heard the complaint. The complaint was registered in heaven. And God decided to respond. And the response was swift, and the response was effective. Turn your Bibles to Numbers 21, chapter 6. I'm sorry, Numbers 21, verse 6. Numbers chapter 21, verse 6. And the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people. And they bit the people. And much people of Israel died. Swift action. That's God's response to their response of his mercy. 
See, they, they, they didn't think much of his mercy, so he responded. And, and then now God responds. And verse 7 is, is the, their response to God's response, really. Numbers 21, verse 7 says this, Therefore the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against thee. Pray unto the Lord that he takes away the serpents from us. And Moses prayed for the people. You know, it's interesting to note that up till now, you don't really have many, and I'm, I'm, I'm being uh, uh, helpful more here. You don't have many instances where Israel admitted they sinned. Up till now, when they were complaining about this and complaining about the lack of that, they had never come back and said, we sinned. Sometimes we don't even view complaints as sin. But when the serpents start hitting, <laughs> come on, <laughs> we sinned. For once they learned to say, I'm sorry. And I found it interesting, you know, God, God, they, they asked for one simple thing, right? Take away the serpents. One simple thing. It's not even a hard request, right? Because the serpents weren't there before. They were protected before. And Moses, who had a lot of clout with God, Moses then said, okay, I'll pray for you. And Moses goes, and I imagine Moses carried the same message. Lord, please take away the serpents. Now, what do you think God did? He could have simply taken away the serpents, but he didn't. There are times where I really do wish the serpents would be gone. When you, when you study with young people, young kids, sometimes you, you teach them with the great controversy and this Satan and all this, and they're just like, why, why didn't God just wipe out Satan? You know, they, they use a different word than wipe out, but it's, it's the same idea, right? Why, why is he around still? But what, but what God did say is, he said, listen, Moses, I want you to take a brass serpent and uh, formulate this brass serpent, and, and I want you to put it on a pole. And any time that they get bit, let them know, raise the pole and let them know that any time they're bitten by this serpent or any serpent, they need to simply look at the serpent on the pole. That's the solution. That's the paradox there. I mean, the, the thing that's causing them the most problems. God says, look at it. And this one amazing thing, it, it, you know, there was nothing in the material, there was nothing in the brass that was used uh, to formulate this serpent that had any healing power. There, there was nothing in the way the light reflected off the brass that, that had any, there was no healing power in and of itself, but the healing power was as they looked at it. And, and the, the, the Hebrew have at least two words for look. One is nabat and the other is ra'ah. And so it wasn't a simple God saying, well, all you have to do is kind of just gaze at it. He says that he used the word that as the children of Israel, ra'ah, as they looked, as they really looked and contemplated, as they started to understand just what it meant, all of a sudden, as they put faith in the healing, they could be changed. As they looked at this symbol, as they looked at this image, <laughs> they could be changed. And I wonder, you know, if you had to make an image, right? You almost think, well, why not make an image of a lamb? You know, well, why not make a, why not say Moses, make the image of a dove? Make, make, make some other image. Don't, don't make an image of, of a snake. In that one act, in that one act, God found a way to transform a cursing into a blessing. The sister here talked about her son, Ian. Most people 
who find themselves in jail would probably look at that as a curse. But God has a way of taking that same curse and making it a blessing. God has a way of taking a tragedy and turning out triumphant. God has all these ways of provisions. There's a young man here, Joseph, who now is looking for another job. It, it almost probably seems bleak, but I believe in a God that can take a very difficult circumstance and say, trust me, I'll, I'll, I'll change this for you. I'll change this for you. When I was, when I was young, I love talking to young people. When I was young, I thought the worst thing that was ever going to happen in my life was I had failed ninth grade. I mean, it was, it was like a stigma. I mean, you, ninth grade is, you don't, you fail lower grades maybe, but you, you don't fail high school. I mean, the stigma with that. And I used to, and my mom would always say, you know, your grades follow you wherever you go, Billy. You, you can't afford to do this. And yet I was in ninth grade again. And everybody knew. And I remember there was this one girl. I, she was married to Deion Sanders. Right? This one girl, she was friends of mine. And, and when I did well in ninth grade the second time around, right? She would call me up and say, oh, I, I see you're on the honor roll. Well, it, it is your second time through. I, mean, I, I, I assume this is a review for you. I mean, she would just beat me with that. Like, why did you call me? You know, I'm really trying now. I'm, I'm really trying to do this and get this right. But she just wouldn't let that, you know. So that curse, that curse turned out into the biggest blessing I could have ever imagined. I never would have saw it coming. I never would have saw it coming. I remember one day I was, I was in college and I was applying for this job. It was an internship and, and I, I had all my ducks lined up. And I was going for an interview. It was in Syracuse, New York. And I knew that they only had three people that they were going to interview for the job. And I'm, the, I'm walking out of this. I had already started making plans of where I'm going to live in Syracuse. I, well, how I'm going to get there. And I'm going to sublet my apartment in Albany. And I, all these plans. And, and then I get the letter. It was a thin letter. I said, like, oh, it's kind of thin. <laughs> it looked like a check is in here. I opened the letter and I, somebody was there and I said, let me, let, me, let me do this in private. I don't, I don't necessarily know what's going down. And I opened this letter. I was like, we are sorry to inform you. I mean, they couldn't even call. Right? We did not select you. I forget the wording. And I started to think, I, I don't have a job. I don't, I don't have a job. And God took that summer and gave me a better job <laughs> with more money <laughs> and I didn't have to move and I didn't have to sublet anything and he did he said I'm not just going to give you a job Billy I'm, I'm going to give you a career Amen. and my career was based off of the letter I received from this company who go nameless God has a way of taking the worst part of your life, I could go on, I, <laughs> I, the worst part of your life, and some of you are sitting here probably thinking in your minds the times where the worst thing that you could imagine happened to you at that time, and you look back on it now and you say, amen for that. I'm so glad God allowed that to happen. It was years later, centuries later, in fact, there was this gentleman who had come he approached this rabbi, and he was asking a simple question. You know, what, what can I do? What can I do? How do I, how do I inherit salvation? And the rabbi looked at him. And the response is in chapter three of John and he responds verse 14 and he makes the he makes the connection with Moses he says and as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness even so must the son of man be lifted up that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have eternal life 
16, say it with me. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Amen. God was able to, to sort of paint down through history and say, you remember that story of, of how that serpent was lifted up. You want to know how to be saved. It's how that serpent was lifted up. And the way that they had to, rah, the way that they had to really look and consider that serpent that was up on that pole, when they look at me, and, and so Jesus even changed it. He, he, he went deeper. He says, when, when I'm lifted up, those who believe in me will not perish, but have everlasting life. It's not just looking at Christ. It's not just doing the casual walkthrough. It's the actual believing in Christ. The solution for the disease that we have is Christ. Serpents will bite consistently. Sin is a, is a marker. Sin is a, an absolute marker. It will mark your life in ways that you never imagined. But God says, anytime you're marked, anytime you're bitten, look to me. Look to me. As I close, I want to say that the, the remedy... The remedy is only as good as the beholder. The remedy is only as good as the beholder. We have to be willing to contemplate Christ. There's a, there's a comment that Ellen White makes that we should spend a thoughtful hour, a thoughtful hour every day contemplating Christ on the cross, the last moments of Christ. And if I'm amazingly honest, I will tell you that I, I don't do that nearly enough. But I find that when I do contemplate Christ on the cross, when I do look at him and I realize what he did and what he did for me and how he's willing to, to just empty heaven for me, it changes me. It doesn't just change my circumstance, but it changes my focus in life. And all of a sudden, the, the little things in the world as the song says, they grow strangely dim. All of a sudden, it's, it's, it's as if the problems are over here and I'm here and God kind of takes a, a heavily tinted glass and he inserts it in between us. And now I can't really see the problems as much as I used to see them very clearly. The financial problems, the health problems, the, the relationship problems, they all start to fade back. I urge you to remember that we are on the cusp of the second coming. We are in the wilderness, folks. We're not in the promised land, but we're in the wilderness. But while in the wilderness, we actually have options. We have options. We can, we can decide to look and see how God has led. We can look to see how God has fed us how God has led us, how, how God has clothed us. We can look to see how God has kept our health. We can look to see how God has fed us water from a rock. We have that option. We can look and see how God desired to save us. And God does something amazing that he says, I... I, in fact, I'm not just going to save you, but I'm going to save you and give you an opportunity to witness for me. I'm going to give you an opportunity to, to live a life that, that lifts me up. And that as I'm lifted up, others will look to you and see me and praise me. The 
you know, it's true that discontentment can spread like a wildfire. But the Bible talks about another fire. The Bible talks about a fire that happened to a band of people in an upper room who once they got on one accord, once they, once they started to come together and resolve issues, the Bible talks about this Holy Spirit power that ignited everyone. And, and, and that same power went out and turned the world upside down. We can have the, the wildfire of, con of discontentment or we can have the Holy Spirit power that changes the world. I want the Holy Spirit power. I want that Holy Spirit power. If you'd like God to refocus your life, if you're like me and you, you know that sometimes things happen and you realize that you're focusing more on the problem and not the solution, if you're focusing more on the curse and not the blessing, and if you're interested in knowing a God who's willing to be there for you in every desert you could possibly imagine. Open your hymns with me. As we sing the first bit of number 290. Just the first stanza and chorus. Turn your eyes. I have to make a quick announcement. I'm so sorry. Does anybody own a white van parked across the street? Um, last name Gibbons. Um, it, they're going to tow it if you want to go out and move your van. It's parked in front of a garage. Okay. Sorry. Amen. Sorry, no, that's all right. Amen. So are you and trouble no light in the darkness you see there's life look at the Savior and life more abundant and free turn your eyes upon Jesus upon Jesus look full in his wonderful face and the things of earth will grow strangely amen in the light of Our Father, our God, we thank you that every day we have the opportunity to experience the bread of life, that we have an opportunity to partake of what you give us, of your salvation. We thank you, Father, that every day that we wake up, we have an opportunity to experience the water from a rock. Because, Father God, you promised to give us water that will quench our thirst so that we will never thirst again. Amen. Father, we thank you for your promises to us. We thank you for the way that you've kept us and the way that you've sustained us and, and carted us through the deserts of life. Father, be with us as we leave here today. May we see you in a new light. May we understand you better. May we come to have a better relationship with you, one that's filled with blessings and thankfulness, Lord. In the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.
Please turn to hymn 373 and let's stand. No, that's good. I hope he gets it in time. Father God, we know that when we, when we focus on you as we ought to, God, we, we don't see the issues of this world and we can focus on seeking the lost, Amen. that we can go out there and be witnesses for you and in all the world, Lord, in the highways and in the byways, Father Amen. God, that we can lift up your name. Be with us as we leave here today. May we always re represent you and reflect you. Amen. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. Dismiss us, Lord.